No, I'll try not to. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dan Brissett with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and it's my privilege to welcome everyone in the room and online to the fourth installment of Congressional Climate Camp. Um, it's been a long but really, really tremendous briefing series. We started back in January by taking a look at the budget and appropriations process, and then in February we talked about public attitudes uh, about uh, climate change over time, non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, things like methane, fluorinated gases, and other pollutants. And here we are today with the Big Kahuna implementing the Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And uh, we have uh, a really excellent program lined up for everyone today. And, uh, and actually, uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of a mega briefing for us. So really, really excited about it. Um, before we get to our panelists, I just want to say a few words about EESI for those of you who are new to our organization. Um, this is what we do. We provide policymakers with uh, science-based, nonpartisan information about climate change topics, and we do our best to do it in a timely and relevant way. Uh, we also do a lot of writing. Uh, we do podcasting. Uh, over time, we've developed expertise when it comes to helping uh, utilities in rural areas access federal resources for uh, inclusive on-bill financing programs. Uh, but really, uh, when we're on Capitol Hill, most of the time, uh, we're doing exactly this, which is convening the best in terms of experts and practitioners uh, to help share information uh, that you all need to do your job and um, maybe most importantly, answer your boss's questions uh, when he comes to you or she comes to you and has questions about uh, climate change uh, topics that are uh, before Congress. So we do the briefings. We also uh, have a really tremendous newsletter called Climate Change Solutions. Uh, we have a lot of briefings. Climate Camp is just one of our briefing series. If you'd like to learn more about what we've got coming down the pike, the best way to do that is to visit us online at eesi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every two weeks. It's a really tremendous resource. Uh, we also do a lot of fact sheets and issue briefs. Sometimes we do big reports. And we have a social media presence. So if you haven't already followed us on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that, uh, our handle is at EESI online. Um, I mentioned uh, our climate camps. If this is your first climate camp, that's OK, uh, because we have you covered. You can go to our website. You can watch archived webcasts of the entire series. Uh, presentation materials are all posted online. Uh, and at some point in the near future, we'll have summary notes um, for the presentations as well. Um, what comes after Climate Camp? Well, um, there's a little thing called the Farm Bill coming down the pike. And so we'll be doing a briefing series, probably kicking off, uh, well, actually kicking off on March 23rd. We'll be doing a briefing about uh, organics uh, with our friends at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And then we'll do more briefings in April, May, and June. We also have a briefing next week, next Wednesday, I think it is, with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. And then we'll be back in April, April 19th, we'll be doing a program on uh, DOE nuclear programs, uh, a briefing on DOE nuclear programs. Um, uh, something we won't talk a lot about today, but a um, huge amount uh, of, of funding in the in, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act for those programs. Um, we have a ton of materials on the front table. I hope everyone uh, helps yourself to the slides and our other written materials. Um, talking about these two pieces of legislation, even independently, but together, I mean, this is 10 pounds of flour in a five pound bag, but we have a lot of other resources um, that I hope you'll avail yourselves of. And if you have additional questions, we'll all be around. We're all wearing our lapel pins. So if you see uh, one of us, please just stop us, whether it's Anna or Molly or someone else, and we'd be happy to take your questions and help you um, fill information gaps that you might be seeing in your work. So it is my privilege to introduce the first of our two panels, uh, and our first of our two speakers on our first panel, Dr. Henry McCoy Jr. is a seasoned professional in business, community and economic development, policy, government, finance, energy, philanthropy, and the academic world. Prior to joining the Department of Energy, Henry served on the faculty at North Carolina Central University School of Business, where he led the entrepreneurship program with additional appointments at Duke, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Harvard. He's a former banking executive, entrepreneur, and former assistant secretary of the North Carolina Department of Commerce. And uh, Henry, thank you so much for joining us to kick off our IIJA IRA implementation briefing. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate this, Dan, and EESI for this opportunity to come and speak to the congressional staff. Um, I think what we're, what we're doing over in the Department of Energy is exciting, and, and certainly your, um, your, your um, Congressional uh, members are a key to this, and so I want to thank you all 
for taking this time here today. I also want to um, do a quick introduction. We have our chief of staff from the Office of State Community Energy Program, um, Chris Castro uh, in, in the back there in a the nice sunny tie. And, um, Marjorie Fields Harris, who is our uh, assistant director of external affairs. Uh, and so it's, it's wonderful to be here and I always enjoy sharing the panel with, with, um, with um, David and um, Nazio. So just to kind of get into it, so the Office of State and Community uh, Energy Program uh, was created as a part of the, um, the um, infrastructure law that got passed in 2021 uh, and it has grown only with, the, uh, with the, the Inflation Reduction Act. And so what we do here at the Office of State and Community Energy Program is really try to find a way to connect to um, tribes and local governments and states to really jumpstart this investment in the community aspect of what we do. I want to give a, a kind of go a little higher for a moment and look at what's happening in, D, in DOE. As a response to the um, bipartisan infrastructure law, um, the IJA, what, what happened was there was a creation of a new infrastructure pillar within the Department of Energy. So it became a, a question of not only this idea of, of let's create resources for infrastructure, but also how are you going to implement those infrastructure dollars into the communities. And so um, the office came about in February 2022, again, as a response to the 2021 um, November legislation. 90% um, of the resources that focus on infrastructure come through this particular infrastructure um, pillar. And we are one of the, the newer offices in that pillar. So if you think about, um, you go back to, to um, uh, fourth grade um, health, uh, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. You think about the work that we do in communities, it's thinking about how do we help communities um, not only survive, but how do we help them thrive? And so if you think about the, the infrastructure pillar, we go from everything from helping individuals who are energy burdened to lower their energy costs, uh, to doing things like you know looking at dom domestic manufacturing, as you know, many of these um, provisions include Buy American, to um, you know, thinking about these clean energy technologies that really will jumpstart us um, and continue to have that world lead, and then really looking at it from a holistic standpoint. We try to look at community in a way that, that imagines, um, you know, what does a decarbonized community look like and, and, and how does that impact everybody? And so the infrastructure pillar really um, looks across that entire um, um, gamut. So if you see that the blue um, is us, the Office of State Community Energy Program, we go by SCIP. Uh, we have seven sister offices within infrastructure and, oh, sorry, and those seven offices that we have within infrastructure are, we all work together to think about community in a very holistic standpoint. And so um, we at SCIP really serve as, a, as some folks call us the tip of the spear to get resources in this community and help uh, communities plan and execute on dollars that, 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 um, that come down. So really um, to that end, SCIP's mission is to be a strategic partner and, and, and really focus on place-based strategy. Um, we really think about what does it mean to transform and um, place uh, in, in ways that, that not only do that physically, but also move communities with it. So how do we, how do we help communities um, rise in, in the process of making these investments? And so to that end, um, we are a, an entity that has almost 30 programs within the Office of State Community programs. And so a key part of those um, 28 programs as we um, sit in our separate pillars is to think about how do we work together um, and think about the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. So we think about this in a very holistic way. So the dollars that the Congress has appropriated us are really leveraged and, and braided and, and brought together in a way that hopefully creates some really um, great emergence. So part of that is the Justice 40 initiative. As many of you probably know, Justice 40, um, President Biden um, signed an executive order a few days after taking office that said that 40% of these benefits should go to historically disadvantaged communities. So we take that seriously and we build that into everything that we do. We also look at how do we deploy clean energy technologies. A, a key part for us is thinking about this idea of looking at a community and thinking about how do we um, increase the absorptive capacity of that community to accept uh, federal dollars and other dollars, information and knowledge and, and technologies to really move those communities forward. And so um, that deploying clean energy really focuses on that. Simultaneously, we want to catalyze economic development. It's, it's about jobs. It's about jobs. It's about jobs. And so a key part of this is how do we make sure that, that we're making creating this connective tissue between the investments that we make and the local economy in a real way um, that, that ties that. But we also want to create ownership amongst communities um, and certainly avoiding pollution through these place-based strategies and reducing energy costs. There's so many individuals who are energy burdened. We want to make sure that we keep that at the forefront of what we do and all that we do. And so SCEP looks at that from a very holistic standpoint. How do we make these investments in these historically disadvantaged communities as well as much broader than that 
we have $16 billion in our, in our uh, funding capacity, and so we know that we can make a, an incredible impact on that. Um, so in, with this idea of this intentional foresight, you have our, our, our slides, but a key part of what I want to um, say about this is that we're looking at these building blocks of success. What that means is that we have $16 billion within our offices at SCIP, but across DOE, we have $100 billion in, in, in resources that, that go into communities. And then if you look at across uh, federal government as a whole, we work very closely with the alphabet soup, right? You know, USDA, DOT, EPA, we, have a, we lead an interagency working group. There's almost half a trillion dollars across all of federal government. How do we weave those, those resources together to really go into a community and stack those dollars on top of each other to, to move forth and to really be, be transformational in those communities? And so, so we try to go in this work with some level of foresight and, and really thoughtfulness. And we want to meet communities where they are. And we want to understand what they need and move forth. So I'm going to go really quickly through some of the programs that we have um, within um, SCEP. And, I know this is a, a, a busy slide, but let me go to the next one. So we have um, a senior slide. We have the, um, our, uh, our um, you know, investments around workforce. And so we have um, $10 million around workforce training and, and creating assessment centers. We also have um, you know, another $10 million as, as relates to career sites. And so partly what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that as the money goes into community, that there, that there are individuals there to actually activate this from a job standpoint. We think about this very, very seriously when we think about jobs, but also thinking about the opportunity for entrepreneurship within communities that historically have been uh, left behind. And so these resources that we have, uh, which equate to the 10 million, the 10 million, another um, 40 million for auditor training, and then we have an, another 200 million that we, that we have within the Inflation Reduction Act um, training. We have $260 million just for training. And we know that that's going to be critical because you need these things to, to line up. We also have a, what this Energy Efficiency Materials Pilot Program, which is really a very complicated way of talking about investing in nonprofits. We invest in, in, in the um, buildings of nonprofits to essentially make them more uh, energy efficient and, and more resilient. We have a kind of sister um, component of that, which is $500 million for the schools program which does the same thing. It looks at going into low-income schools and, and upfitting those buildings to be energy efficient. And the idea with both of those is that if you can save resources on the energy costs, those resources can then be reinvested back into community. They can be reinvested back into young people. They can connect those young people to those job opportunities. And so we're very excited about that work from that standpoint. We have five, $550 million in energy efficiency block grant funds. We talk about momentarily. And then we have the state energy program, which has been around for the last almost 50 years, every state gets resources on an annual basis to really think about what do they want to do from a planning standpoint. And then the weatherization program, which has been around uh, similarly long, and that program is to go in to low-income communities and, and weatherize homes. And so we're very excited about the connective uh, tissue from a community standpoint of, of each of these programs. Here's the big kahuna, the Inflation Reduction Act, right? So when I started, I started this role, uh, the office of the infrastructure office started in February 2022. I started my role in the new office of SCIP in July of 2022. So when I started at the end of July, we had $6 billion. About three weeks later, when the Inflation Reduction Act passed, we had $16 billion. <laughs> and so, uh, so you, you can see how quickly things turn around. But we have $10 billion in, in our provisions, and um, a lot of folks hear about these rebates, um, the rebates that, that, that folks would get. And, and so it, it, it looks at doing everything from electrification of the homes to, 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 to make sure that the homes are ready to, to be electrified, but also uh, getting rebates for appliances. And one of the things that we're focused on is making it simple for low-income individuals. So these programs are, are um, you know, they, they tiered, but a lot of the, the, the benefit will go to ind individual 80% of the AMI, area median income or below, um, up to 150% of AMI. Um, and we are focused on, on using, utilizing technologies and things of that nature to give rebates at point of sale. So it's not like when we were growing up where, you know, you got that box of cereal, you cut the side off and you sent the rebate in and with the receipt and you waited six weeks to get that $5 or whatever, you, you know, <laughs> it's not that kind of game. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that in, in, individuals can go to the, the point of sale and have the rebate instantly. And, and that's up to 100% of the pro cost of the product so that they may not have to, you know, come out of pocket for anything. So we're working with states and NASDAQ and others to, to figure that out. We've had a great working relationship around that. So the Inflation Reduction Act is, is a huge part of this. Um, next is TA, Technical Assistance Partnerships. A key part of the work that we do is try to make sure that our grantees 
really have the best information and knowledge that they can to move communities forward, right? And again, you have to meet folks where they are. If I go to California, they may say, Henry, go sit down somewhere. We got this covered, right? You know, we, California's office is bigger than mine um, from, from a standpoint of this work. But you know, I, go, I may go someplace else and they, 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 may need, they may need me additional kind of help. And so we have a number of different um, programs that, that focus on technical assistance and delivery. Uh, we have, um, you know, working with, uh, you know, different programs. We have almost 240 partners that we're working with on different technical assistance efforts and things of that nature. So it's really critical and crucial for us that that's how we learn. We go in and we, we communicate. Part of what I tell my team and we talk about all the time is that we, we should get smarter. With every dollar that we put in the community, we should get smarter about the next dollar we put in, right? And that takes learning from, from the communities, listening to the communities, understanding what works and what doesn't work. And so TA is a key part of that. Um, we have a few tools that, that we utilize uh, as it relates to um, um, helping communities understand kind of what their economic um, and, and environmental landscape looks like. And so one is something we call SLOPE, which is a, a great interactive tool. You can go on and you put your community in, and it comes up and, and basically shares with you kind of what is your energy burden. It shares with you a, a bunch of different um, information that can help the community then make better decisions about where should we go, where, where are we in our, in our process. And so that's a tool that's had 12,000 unique visitors, I think, in, in just the last year alone. Um, we have a low-income energy affordability data lead tool does a, a lot when we're trying to think about how to invest in those historically disadvantaged communities. And so, so we, we, we really use data to drive our work, uh, and, 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 and that's important to us. Um, I just kind of, I, I cover this really quick because I know um, time is running short, but we've, over the last um, year, we've put out billions of dollars in each of these different programs, weatherization, um, you know, the state energy program, energy efficiency conservation block grants. We put them out into the community. We want this money to get into the, into the hands of the people in the community to, to move forward and, and, to, and to be uh, impactful. So um, I, I, what I do is I, I probably save some of this when we sit down for Q&A, but a key part of what we do is really figure out how do we want to benefit and help um, communities, and particularly historically disadvantaged communities. And so we, we have built in this, this notion of putting in a community benefit agreement with every, every, every grant program that we have. We want to make sure that everybody is very conscious of making these investments, um, how we, you intend to in, impact the communities um, that are the most in need. So actually what I do, because I know you have the slide deck in front of you, I wrap up so we can hear from, 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 from David and, and the wonderful work they're doing, but certainly when we get in Q&A, I'd love to talk more about how these dollars are really impacting the, the communities at the ground level. So thank you so much. Thank you, Henry. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. I think I'm just going to move ahead. I think actually, David, you don't have a slide. So I may just leave up this very nice thank you slide um, that Henry ended with. But yes, a um, couple quick reminders. Um, uh, Henry's presentation is extraordinary because of the amount of information that's in there. There are printed copies out front. If you want an online version or an e-version, you can visit us uh, online and, and download it. It's a lot of really great information and a lot of practical information that you can draw from our staff, too, about how to uh, interact with these programs. Um, also would like to, um, uh, Henry sort of um, segued into the idea of questions. We will, in fact, have questions. We'll have uh, uh, the ability to ask questions here in the room. If we're in our online audience, and I would say we have a robust online audience right now, um, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at ESI.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, at ESI Online, and ask us a question that way. Um, and Henry called out a few of his folks today, but um, he mentioned the Energy Efficiency Materials Pilot Program. So just in case they're watching, I can embarrass them a little bit, but that's a program we've been working on a lot at ESI, and uh, Henry's team working on the, 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 the nonprofits program and the schools program is just really killing it. So... Kudos to Sarah and everyone there working on that. So thank you very much. Our second panelist is David Terry. David is the president of the National Association of State Energy Officials, and he's worked with NASIO uh, in a variety of capacities since 1996. David leads NASIO, NASIO's policy actions and programs in support of the 56 governor-designated state and territorial energy directors and their offices. Uh, NASIO communicates the state's views on virtually all national energy issues, David has participated in governor-led policy meetings, testified before Congress, and presented at White House and International Energy Forum. 
David has 25 years of experience working on a range of energy issues for such organizations as the Governor's Wind and Solar Energy Coalition and Energy Services Coalition. And most importantly, he's a member of our Board of Directors. Uh, so we really appreciate his support in, in multiple ways. David, I'll invite you to the lectern and um, we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dan. You. I'm going to see if I can close that for a little room. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to uh, thank Dan and the EESI team. It's an amazing organization. Um, I'm not just because I'm a board member, because I see their impact every day and the information they put out. And I think about the nonpartisan approach, informative approach that our uh, founding former Congressman Ottinger brought to this organization uh, and Jared Blum, our um, chair of the organization, was a great uh, leader for all of us. I wanted to just cover a couple of background things very quickly. One, for those of you who don't know, uh, as Dan alluded to, we represent the 56 state territory and District of Columbia energy directors in their offices. About 80% of those directors are governor appointed or serve at the pleasure of the governor. Uh, they cover uh, every energy issue imaginable. They're policy oriented and forward looking, um, economic development, climate, workforce, all the things governors care about, um, they're thinking about in the lens of energy. That means they cover everything from building energy codes on the one hand to transmission planning on the other, advanced nuclear technologies, opening markets, financing, the whole gamut, and our organization reflects that. Um, the IAJA and the IRA present a pretty amazing opportunity, um, needless to say, and I want to start, though, with a, a little bit of a level set. And there are two parts to this. Um, the second part's almost more important than the first part. The first part is, with the exception of the weatherization assistance program, no IAJ or IRA dollars have gone to the states yet. So if you're wondering what they did with the funding, they haven't done it yet because they don't have the money yet. Um, the other part of that that's incredibly important is Congress delivered to DOE a real, and the other agencies, but DOE in particular, a huge challenge. Um, the number of programs, doing it responsibly, planning, um, and hats off, uh, since Henry has been with us, it doesn't even seem like, it hasn't been a year yet. Um, I think the engagement, honestly, between DOE and the states has increased multiple fold. It's been a huge positive. The staff there, Chris, uh, Anna Garcia, others, um, the offices, grid deployment office, Maria Robinson, um, Jean Rodriguez now at the Office of Electricity, Alejandro Moreno at EERE. Everybody is running flat out. If you see them, thank them. They're doing their jobs well for all of us, uh, as are the state directors. So with that, I wanted to hit on really three items. One, just a little bit of a state lens on the infrastructure and IRA benefits. Um, those vary a lot. People are still digging into it, but they are moving. They are planning and acting. I want to talk a little bit about that. The second one is, is not talked about as much in the media or in meetings, and that's the cross-cutting elements in different programs. Uh, there's an enabling component there that we hear from industry that's really important. We think a lot about what the private sector is doing. They're the ones that make the investment choices. We pay a lot of attention to that. And third, just some examples of what we see states either planning or acting on um, with just some quick examples. And there's a lot more. A spoiler alert, I'm not going to do a long list, uh, but give you a, a bit of a teaser. I think the, the first piece is uh, there's a foundational program, and Henry mentioned this, the U.S. State Energy Program. It's an annual appropriation. It's been around for many years. The annual appropriation is very modest. Uh, 65 million last year spread across 56 states and territories. You might think, wow, that's not very much. It's not a lot of money, but it's an incredibly flexible program. It is the glue that holds together so many of the state private sector partnerships in the utility industry, uh, actions the governor's office leads. It's used for planning, statewide energy planning, emergency response and preparedness, uh, building energy code education, uh, voluntary programs around schools, financing of public-private infrastructure, whole range of items. And I'm going to come back to that a couple of times, not only because we care about that program a lot and the ongoing nature of it, but it was also funded under the IAJ at $500 million. A good portion of that goes out to the states. Uh, they haven't received that yet, but they will soon, and they're thinking already about how they use that. All of those programs that Henry listed have, almost all of them, have a state, a central state component. The SEP funds are used for planning around hydrogen hubs, workforce development, uh, planning around EV infrastructure that comes out of the Department of Transportation. We have a partnership there I'll talk about. A um, whole variety of activities. That is really the glue. It's the only flexible funding the states get from the federal government for these activities in a normal year and under the IJA. Transmission planning, all those pieces they put together working with their private sector, local government, constituents, disadvantaged communities, that's what they accomplish. And that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Front and center in all of that is the, are these sort of 
multi-headed um, challenges, which are opportunities in the context of these bills of affordability, reliability, and climate, and a variety of other things that are important to state and local governments, depending on the state. The second piece I want to end on is that cross-cutting component. Um, part of that is, has a foundational element in the state energy program, but also think about the dollars that you probably have heard about coming out of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, some $27 billion divided in different ways, additional planning funds. A lot of those are financing components, some grants. Um, a lot of those are also funding specific climate projects that states and local governments individually tee up that make sense for their, for their communities. There are big chunks for workforce development as well, both at DOL, the Department of Energy, and state dollars. The financing component really can't be overstated, but the other piece of this is, this is something very familiar to everybody in the room, permitting and, and uh, zoning and uh, siting of energy projects of all types. And that cross-cutting planning money, some of which is in the IJA, most of which is in the form of the state energy program or existing state and local dollars, are critical to realizing any of the infrastructure uh, dollars that were passed out of Congress. Not a new topic, everybody knows it here well, it's important, but there are different pieces of that. And I think we can't overstate the, the, really the part that state governments in particular have in working with their industry. Most of these activities are in the control of state local governments in the private sector. There is a federal role, obviously, but that cross-cutting piece, none of this happens without it, and, and really just wanna stress that. We see great actions in states like Indiana where the governor and the legislature have moved voluntary programs to get local governments renewable ready, for example, for siting, so that the community is educated about what it means and what it doesn't. We're also separately in other states beginning to work with renewable project developers so that they come into a community with a clear mind and a plan about how they're gonna engage the community up front. There are a lot of things that none of us do as well as we could in this space. There are great examples here. There are also tougher problems on federal land, excuse me, and siting on federal lands, particularly in the West, uh, that have to be resolved. And those are more federal issues, Department of Interior, um, and certainly in the offshore uh, wind and other areas. The third place I wanted to touch on briefly are some of the examples of what we're seeing. And again, these are things that people have at the state level, plans in the works. The dollars haven't started flowing yet, but they're getting ready. The hydrogen hubs, which received, I mean, really so much news um, and, uh, and not hype, but news in the sense of everybody was engaged and interested. In every region of the country, our members came together with their governors, created regional collaboratives around hydrogen and hydrogen hubs, thought about what it meant for their businesses, for the resources they have, and many of them bid on those projects. We'll see what the outcomes are. Um, I, I won't cite any particular region except to say, Everybody took a little bit different approach that made sense for them. It's a huge opportunity. We had just deeply involved in no particular order, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Colorado, New York, California, New Jersey, all of the energy offices across the country, nearly all of them engaged in this topic in one way or another and working toward those hubs. There's a section of the IJA, we call it 40101D for shorthand, it's grid resilience. There are formula funds that go to the states, there are competitive funds that go to utilities, both consumer and investor owned, large and small, two and a half billion dollars to the states. The energy offices, about 90% of them were designated by their governors to handle these funds. They're working with their utilities and their communities to see where they can plug holes, if you will, in grid resilience issues that are at their state level. It's obviously a small drop in the bucket compared to what we need to do, but it gets people moving directionally the right way. We have Tennessee engaged that in that, California, Hawaii, New York, almost every state working, putting together plans. Those get submitted to the Department of Energy in about another two weeks. So we'll begin to see what those looks like. They unfold over five years. The uh, EV infrastructure activities, this is a really amazing story. It, it came about in an odd way, we'll, we'll skip that. But we have the Department of Energy, the federal level, and the Department of Transportation, the state energy offices, and the state transportation offices. That sounds really complicated. It's an amazing success story already. Um, the NEVI dollars, $5 billion, the states have turned in their plans. Uh, the state DOTs and energy offices completed a round of six regional meetings on plan implementation. The dollars will be flowing. And the in integration with the industry, both the electric industry and the auto industry and the providers are going really well. It's a good story, good news. They're beginning to think about what that means for other areas of transportation electrification. The joint office at DOE, um, again, couldn't be going better. People are very pleased. I will say, just to maybe pat the energy offices on the back, they've been working on alternative fuels issues for 30 years. They've been working on EVs since before there was a Tesla S. They've been thinking about this, so they were ready to run, and I think their DOT partners have uh, done the same thing. 
transmission planning, we have a variety of working groups that our members participate in, looking at different regional issues around transmission. There's obviously a lot of siting work here, but there are also some low-hanging fruit, some seams issues between different parts of the grid, particularly in the Midwest and the center part of the country, between the eastern and western interconnect. Another low-hanging fruit piece is reconductoring, high-efficiency transmission cable that carries two and three times the load at 20% less line loss, that's efficiency, you have more power making it from the plant to the actual end point. Cost effective already, we're not doing nearly enough of it. It's made here in the US already. It's really a no brainer. So our folks are working on that as well. Um, last couple of items, carbon utilization um, and carbon capture. I, I think probably the best success story here, we see it along the Gulf Coast, the Petrochem complex, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma. They've been working this issue for a while. Billions of dollars in private investment, to build on existing carbon pipelines, existing refineries, existing hydrogen infrastructure, in fact, bringing that together to take advantage of some of the fossil uh, energy and carbon management office at DOE resources, but also the tax credits. And that is the other part of this story in the IRA. We have huge tax credits that are, are becoming available very quickly. Treasury's working really fast with DOE and other agencies to make that happen. The private sector set, stepping up. The states are savvy to what those are. They're looking at their resources, their businesses, and seeing how they can jumpstart that. This is a place where that's happening in real time, and I really commend you to take a look at it. We have resources about most of these on our website. Um, I won't uh, do anything except tell you, just type in Google in the term, Google NASIO hydrogen, NASIO transmission, you'll probably get where you wanna go. The last one probably has the most attention, and those are the high efficiency electrification rebates uh, and the so-called home, whole home rebate program. Most people think of them as one program, there are actually two. It's a total of $9 billion, about $4.2 billion each. Our members manage those funds, they will all come to them. As Henry mentioned, we are working hand in glove with their staff. These are complicated programs. We have a major task force, including almost every state in the country that we work with, about uh, 50 private sector companies, uh, ranging from uh, retailers such as Lowe's and Home Depot, small and large, manufacturers, train, uh, manufacturer heat pumps, Ream, Whirlpool, a long list. I'm leaving a lot of people out that contribute to this. And they're thinking through, what is the consumer experience gonna be like? A lot of those dollars are reserved for low-income folks. What is their experience gonna be like? How is it gonna benefit th them? How do we do it fairly? It's a complicated program, and I think um, it's worth taking a little time to get it right. There's a rush to get it out. People have a need. We want to meet that. We also want to do it right. So I'm going to pause there. Happy to take questions and appreciate the time, Dan. I wasn't joking about 10 pounds of flour in a five-pound bag. This is an enormous set of topics. Um, we have a microphone wrangler by the name of Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. And if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we will do our best to find you. If you have uh, questions in the online audience, oh, we have David up here actually. Uh, we'll start with you. Um, since you're the, uh, the, the person who made all of this possible with the Sustainable Energy um, uh, Coalition and Representative Tonko's office. So uh, David, why don't we start with you and um, uh, we'll go from there. Great, thanks. Hi, yeah, uh, David Scott, uh, Executive Director of the House Sustainable Energy Environment Coalition. Uh, connecting both of your points on on on, on the rebate programs, uh, uh, you referenced that they're uh, set up to be point of sale, which of course will will help with the take up. Uh, but since these are handled by the states, and there is the the income component of this, uh, what is it starting? What are you all uh, exploring at this point in terms of how you will do point of sale while also verifying uh, uh, income levels? Well, I, I um, start out and then I let David jump in too. So he's been heavily involved in these conversations. So, so there is an income verification aspect of this where we're making sure that the, the individual um, is um, being qualified to get these resources. What we're looking at is, is, you know, and I know the conversations have been around, you know, what is the, the best way to gather that information? I mean, there, there are certainly certain privacy issues, of course, that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to figure these things out. So we're looking at, I know, a number of tools. Uh, I know some states have... Um, tools already that they're using for, for income verification. There's also, um, you know, certainly we have partner agencies that, that like SNAP and, 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 and um, you know, um, HUD and public housing and things of that nature where we're pretty sure that folks in those areas are qualified. And I think it's really thinking about, um, you know, what is the, the, the best way to, to leverage um, tools and, 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 and make it easy to really verify this income, again, maintaining privacy um, of the individual but also not delaying it beyond 
what needs to happen. Um, David, I know you've been heavily involved um, with my team on this. Yeah, I, and it is, it's a complicated question, but I, just a couple of things I think I would share. Uh, one, I think there's maybe, if, if you don't work in this space at the state level or maybe the national level, you might intuitively think a national program would be easier. By the time you talk to three or four states or three or four people in the business, you pretty quickly realize that from an implementation perspective, it would have been impossible. Um, you have rural state, states, largely urban states. You have, um, in every state, as much money as this is, it's a fraction of the low-income population that benefits. How do you decide and choose? So the point of sale piece is important, much as Henry said. Income verification will happen by the state. Retailers will not be dealing with that. Providers won't be dealing with that. Coming up with an interface, which I, I suspect DOE will have some opt-ins for states, but states have run rebate programs like this for a long time. This is larger. I'm not diminishing that it's not complicated. But you also have the issue of um, the lens through which you see the 80% of uh, area, area median income, for example, and how you apply that differs greatly from state to state. There's parts of the countries where a, uh, a heat pump, a low temperature heat pump, may make a lot of sense in a household. There are parts of the country when it's not going to make sense. So there's a differentiation of product. There's a consumer education component um, that goes to this. So the states will handle the income verification component. They'll look through lenses such as the state uh, low-income programs they offer already, federal programs, to try and pre-qualify people so that a, a customer doesn't have to go through all of those hoops before they get to their local retailer or their provider, whoever's providing that service, and that they have some kind of reasonable, probably largely electronic, but also there needs to be a paper means, not everybody is electronic, um, in order to capture that rebate. There is certain data and information that um, I think we and DOE are in pretty strong alignment that need to be collected in that process so we know how the money's being used. Um, we saw this in ARA, just as a really quick refresh, there was a rebate program in ARA for Energy Star equipment. The states ran that flawlessly. Every one of them, the territories um, across the country, uh, operated those, no fraud, no abuse. It's run well. I think we'll see a very similar thing here. It, it, there's a lot to think through. The one thing I would caution uh, there is a big push politically, both in, in, at certain parts of the states and at the federal government, to move very quickly because there's a need and a desire to get something done. I would suggest this is a program you don't want to make a mistake on. And I, I am concerned that we take the time that we and, and Henry and his team have been taking and use that well so the consumer has a good experience, the retailer has a good experience, the manufacturer has a good experience, and we have a good story to tell when we're done. Hi, thank you very much to both of you. Um, can I ask two questions? <laughs> One well, to since each. you're a panelist on the second panel, I suppose oh, I have privilege. to. Privilege. So go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, to um, Mr. McCoy. I was wondering with all these programs, uh, amazing programs that go through the states, how are we, you going to ensure kind of like an equitable flow of capital to all states, including those states that are not as motivated as others? to implement these um, changes? Oh yeah, well, great, great question. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it, this, this equity piece that I mentioned is a, is a critical part of this work, right? One doesn't go um, without the other. And so part of what we, we, we do, of course, and your question has some layers in it, right? I mean, on one level, we have formula programs that every state is qualified for. I mean, they, 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 they get the amount of money and that's what you're getting. Um, we also know that, that um, you know, different states may look at these resources in different ways um, as it relates to the decision to, to draw them down and, and things of that nature. But in terms of working with the state energy office, I mean, um, everyone I've worked with has just been tremendously um, dedicated to the communities that they come from, right? And so I, I say this, I, we feel like that, um, you know, we, we've baked into our process, our, our um, um, application process, as I mentioned before, community benefits agreement. So we're making sure that, that everyone thinks about how um, the community has to benefit from these resources. And again, I, I feel like the states are already really motivated uh, around that. Um, we also hope that um, within this context that we want politics to be out of it in that sense, right? Where that, that when you're talking about um, connecting to people, particularly people that, are, that, that really need a lot of the opportunity and, and you know, whether it be workforce or things of that nature, that um that that you know every state will just decide to participate but we have now through justice 40 through our systems around grants we have systems that basically capture data on that so the states have to report 
local governments have to report what, what they're doing around Justice 40. Um, um, they're also, I mean, um, David and his team have been wonderful about saying, hey, you know, we, we really want to work with you all around, um, you know, how, to, how do we see the Justice 40 um, um, get implemented and, and the work around that. So, so I say that to say that, that so many of our programs, uh, I mean, at the very foundation, we start out thinking about how is this going to um, go in and, and help the communities um, that really most need it. And so I feel like that, that um, you know, with that as a foundation, uh, it's, it's impacting everything that we do and how we design the, the, our programs. Uh, how we implement them, again, how we meet communities where they are to really understand what they need and not just sitting kind of um, kind of in the ivory tower. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, second question is regarding the rebates. So I am concerned with um, the ability for, again, small local contractors. You said this is going to be had at the point of sale. So, you know, when you talk about the big networks, the Lowe's and the Home Depot's, and that's all good, but then you have communities that work with their local installers. Are you thinking about working with the, the people or the organization, nonprofits, CDFIs that finance low-income communities and therefore use local installers that are underbanked or that may not be using these networks? Or are you thinking of other resources like that? Yeah, I have been, and that's sort of the everyday business, frankly, that it was the precursor to all these programs. Most of the states were already doing that, so it's a nice, it's a natural fit. They need to do that for their local communities. But I want to back up to your other question. I, I know every state really well. Everybody's motivated. This is exciting, important work. They have constituents that need it. I just, there's, that's not an issue. Not to say that every industry in the country, including government, is short-staffed. And that's true at the federal level, state level, local level. So there is that. Um, if there's any detection of not motivation, it's not motivation. It's just, you know, if you haven't tried to hire anybody recently, let me tell you, it's challenging. So on, the, on your point, though, yeah, part of the challenge in designing the rebate program, much as the Energy Star rebate program in 2010 was designed by each individual state, they had to make that program for, um, you know, Sue's one-person HVAC company and Acme Incorporated with 10,000 employees or 100,000 employees. And you can do that. It's not easy, but you can do that. It's not new. There also are utility programs, many of which our members oversee or are engaged with that operate as well. Some of those are a good fit. Some of those are not a good fit. This is a different animal. Um, weatherization assistance program, in some respects, that's a good fit. In some re respects, not for these programs. So that's the part where I said it may feel like a national program is a great idea. Um, one size fits all. Um, not surprisingly, being a state organization, we don't think that's a good idea. And that's not what Congress delivered, which I think was pretty wise. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And given you, the enthusiasm that you referred to, David, and I want to ask Dr. McCoy as well as Dan, really quickly, um, what's going to be the role of the U.S. Congress, given the landmark nature of this legislation? How does Congress fit into the implementation and down the road over the next months and years? What do you see their role during that time? Happy to start. I think um, at least two roles. I think there are probably many. Uh, first and foremost, oversight, clearly. That's important. We need a check and balance on what's being done, the pace at which it's being done, um, all the things that are part of the congressional responsibility role um, and authority. I, I think the other piece is a lot harder. And I talked a little bit with Dan about it before the, the session, but the expectation setting. Um, just by accident, nobody on purpose, some in the media, some in advocacy groups, some at the federal and state level, um, the message that we send about these programs, that the dollars are available now and come get them, the rebate programs are exhibit A. There's been a lot in the media as though you can go and get your rebate tomorrow and it's open to everybody. That is not true. It is not open, it hasn't started, and it's not available to everybody. It's intended to largely be a low-income program. So I think congressional expectation setting and the differentiation it's a lot different to build a transmission project than it is to run a rebate program than it is to help weatherize somebody's home for next winter. So I think those are the expectation setting as well. Obviously, the oversight and measurement is an important one, and, and we support that kind of transparency. I think DOE has a good record of transparency on these issues. The states, that is what they do every day. Yeah, and I, and I will, I will um, you know, think back on that, uh, Amy, in that part, and uh, I'll add an initial that's going to sound a little self-serving, right? Um, a number of these provisions are one-time provisions, right? But if you think about the, the job ahead, particularly as it relates to investments in communities, um, you know, we all, often talk about 
things like you know the, the t great technical challenges of, of, of decarbonization and, and, and energy um, and things of that nature, floating wind, hydrogen, all these kind of things. But it's also a pretty incredible technical challenge in terms of how to get these resources into communities, particularly the communities that are, have been kind of left behind over time. And that's not a, a one-time or two-year, three-year thing. I mean, that takes time. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that as a part of this process that we can not only look at the re kind of resources that are going to our legacy programs, but also think about, you know, some of these great pilots that are being done right now, some of these things that are being invested in now, you know, are there ways for those to, to, to ultimately show up in, in, base, pro, in base funding and long-term funding uh, on, a, on, a regular, on an annual basis? Understanding we're going into these communities and asking them to put together plans that are real long-term plans. How do we make sure that we're funding those plans in the long term? And hopefully we can take politics out of it and just think about the idea of getting communities to access the capital. Um, so. No, because we have one last quick rapid fire question from the audience. I'd like to make sure we get to you. We've got our question corner up here in the front. So, Tyler, and then we'll switch panels and people can take a donut break. Hi, uh, my name is Aiden from the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun. Uh, my question is I don't know if this is the right forum, but on carbon capture, utilization, storage, et cetera, I'm wondering how the IRA addresses the kind of issues of like scaling that to a large scale and making it like cost effective because I think I feel like that's one of the biggest issues these days with that kind of technology. I, I can take a stab at that. Not not my area of expertise. My staff are better at it, but I will tell you um, the IRA tax credit component, the additional um, uh, more than doubling of the, the price of carbon in the tax makes it financially feasible. And I, I always point to the petrochem sector along the Gulf Coast where we do have some of that infrastructure in place already and you have an end use case for it already. There are other examples that we have to build out in other parts of the country. So I think that part is, there's a path to that being economic that's, that, that is quicker in that part of the economy in that part of the country. And I think that's one to focus on. There's a really natural connection to the hydrogen activities as well in that particular market. And I uh, would recommend that uh, you take a look at a Pennsylvania company, Air Products, um, they're actively engaged in that area, most of the major oil companies, but I think probably the best example, um, Governor Edwards in Louisiana and his team at the Energy Office, um, they have been leading on this for some time. One of the missing components that is incredibly challenging is uh, class six well. These are the wells where the uh, carbon would be uh, pumped down in storage, if you will. There's a lot of science around it. It's a safe, proven um, uh, technology and approach. Giving the states primacy, which is a normal process on many environmental regulations, um, to do that so we can move more quickly is important. Um, that has been moving very slowly for uh, two administrations. We hope it goes more quickly. I think uh, the administrator, Regan, is doing a great job of moving that forward, but that's a critical component we have to move more quickly on. Private sector is investing, and they are ready to go, waiting on that action. Um, well, thank you very much, and thanks for the last question. Um, Henry and David, uh, thank you for joining us today and, and sharing your um, thoughts about how everything is going in the world of IIJA and IRA. Um, I did six years at the Maryland Energy Administration. State energy offices are critically important uh, in all the ways that David said. And if you haven't already reached out to your state energy office or to NASIO, um, I definitely recommend you do that. Uh, it's a great resource to understand exactly what's happening for the benefit of your states and districts. And Henry, again, thanks to you and your amazing team at DOE that's growing, uh, it seems, by the day, which is excellent. I, you need all the help you can get, and we're all rooting for you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think they deserve a round of applause. So we are going to transition to panel number two. Um, for those of you who are in the room, um, there are some donuts in the back. This would be a grace, uh, a time to do that with grace if you wish to go get one. Um, make sure to come back because you're not going to want to miss our second panel. It's quite good. Sorry we didn't get to the online questions. Uh, we'll do our best uh, for the second panel. Um, and um, as a reminder, if you'd like to go back and see any of uh, David's presentation or Henry's presentation, Everything will be available online, including their presentation materials. Henry's slides, in particular, um, are great, um, and so I encourage you. And, and also, uh, we didn't talk much about it, but um, Henry's slides also has some suggestions about how congressional staff can stay updated. Um, David talked about how, how things are happening, present tense, future tense, uh, and so there's some great recommendations in there about how staff can keep up um, with what's going on. Do we need to open the laptop?
All right, let's open the laptop. Um, great. All right, so we have three quarters of our panel. Uh, who are we missing? Kevin. Oh, no. Come on. Where'd she go? Where'd she go? She's probably getting a donut. I don't blame her. They're Dunkin' Donuts. We're not, we're not beholden to house catering in this room, so we splurged. Um, there she is. All right. So here we go. We'll move on to our first panelist's slides. Great. All right. So second panel, we have four really tremendous folks uh, who will be sharing their expertise. A lot of the issues actually that came up in the last panel will be dealt with again on this panel um, in even greater detail. Um, our first panelist is Sarah Klein. Sarah is an independent consultant specializing in transportation policy. She began her career in the U.S. Senate, where she served for eight years as counsel to the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. On the Banking Committee, she had responsibility for all transit-oriented or transit-related matters, as well as various housing, finance, and insurance issues. She further developed her transit expertise as Director of Policy and Government Relations for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. She led policy development and research for two national nonprofit organizations, Transportation for America and Reconnecting America. And today, Sarah is joining us as a consultant to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Sarah, welcome to the briefing. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Whoop. Knock over the mic. Can everyone in the back hear me OK? That's often a challenge. OK, terrific. Um, and we'll make sure the slides advance. They do. Great. So I'm here to talk about specifically the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. I'm going to start with a brief overview of this enormous bill, trans, uh, then go to some uh, more deep dive into some transportation programs, and finally talk a little bit about the status of implementation. So as you all know, this is an enormous bill authorizing $1.2 trillion for infrastructure across a variety of sectors, transportation being the largest in terms of dollar amount, but also energy, broadband, water, a variety of other things as well. This is a really unique piece of legislation, and I think it's worth just pausing for a moment to note how it's so unique. First of all, Congress mushed together all of these infrastructure sectors into one bill, which almost never happens. Usually, Congress works in silos and does each program separately. Uh, it also mushes together authorization and appropriation, which again usually is done separately, but in this case decided to do some of both. Um, and as a little point of interesting legislative history, it didn't go through the usual House-Senate conference process, but instead was directly negotiated between a group of senators and the White House. Um, but it ultimately did pass in November 2021 with bipartisan support. Of the funding in the infrastructure law, um, more than half of it goes out by formula, meaning that the law itself specifies who's going to get the funds and how much they're going to get. A lot of that formula funding goes directly to state agencies, as we've heard a little bit about. My slides are, didn't, my numbers didn't quite work. It's 75% in the transit program. In addition to all those formula funds, there are over 100 competitive grant programs in the infrastructure law. Uh, this is just an enormous number of opportunities for states, counties, cities, tribes, and other entities to apply for funding directly from the federal government. We have on the Bipartisan Policy Center website a list of all of those programs, just in case you can't read the tiny little print on the screen. Um, that's just a subset anyway, because there's a whole bunch of programs. So you can take a look at that if you are interested in seeing what types of opportunities are going to be available over the next five years for folks in, in your districts. The White House is doing us a big favor in this regard by uh, reporting out on the website build.gov what funding has already been announced or awarded. And they have a really cool interactive map. They didn't, they didn't tell me to say this. I don't even know who's putting it together, but I think it's cool where you can zoom down even to the county level, uh, click on one of the little dots, and see what grants have been awarded already in, uh, in that county. So I, I encourage everyone to check it out because it's pretty cool. Zooming into transportation a little bit, which is, as I said, the bulk of the funding in the IIJA and also my particular area of expertise, so that's what I'm going to talk about. 
Um, most of that funding, as I said, does go directly to state departments of transportation in, through formula programs. Um, I've listed the major formula programs here on the slide. Look at those numbers for a second. The, this slide itself, these seven programs, are well over $200 billion. So the, the scale of this is really just enormous. So because this is Congressional Climate Camp, you might be wondering which ones of these are the climate programs. Well, there are four of these formula programs that are specifically focused on climate kind of climate friendly uh, projects or program projects to reduce emissions. The Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program has been around for decades actually, has been the signature climate program of the Surface Transportation um, Acts for many years. But the IIJA uh, enacted three new formula programs specifically focused on carbon reduction, which is for projects that reduce emissions, a PROTECT program, which I can't remember what that stands for, but the program is focused on resilience, uh, and then the charging and, and fueling formula program, which is designed to support uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure and other, other fueling infrastructure. So these four are specifically focused on climate, but those two at the top, which those two programs themselves actually represent just by themselves more than $200 billion. They can also be used for climate friendly projects if state departments of transportation choose to use them that way. In fact, state departments of transportation have a lot of flexibility in how they use federal highway funding. Uh, it's called highway funding. It can be used for highways. It can be used for bridges, for repair, for construction, et cetera but can also be used for transit, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, traffic management programs. It can be used for charging and resilience. So there are tons of resources available actually uh, for these types of programs. Switching to the competitive side, as I mentioned, there's a bazillion of these new competitive programs. There are some with a specific climate focus, um, low, low and no emission buses, um, more funding for charging and fueling and, re and resilience as well as other specific programs like reduction of emissions at ports. Um, but just like with the formula side, there are lots of other programs that may not specifically call out themselves as climate programs, but can be used for emission reducing projects. So they may be focused on safe streets. They may be focused on innovative technologies. All of those types of programs can also support uh, projects to reduce emissions. So if I leave you with one bottom line here, it's that the whole surface transportation program, these, these multiple hundreds of billions of dollars, can be considered to be a climate program. It's going to have an impact on our emissions uh, in the future. We just don't know for sure today exactly what that impact is going to be, because as was alluded to in the first panel, a lot of the decisions have not yet been made at the state and local level as to how these funds are going to be used. So there's a complex looking graph on this slide that was put together by the Georgetown Climate Center who ran two different scenarios making some estimates about what types of projects these funds might be used for. And the bottom line here, which is kind of, um, seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but they did a lot of analysis to, to show it, um, is that if these funds, if the states and, and communities getting these funds decide to invest them in projects that encourage, um, for example, more driving and we have less electric vehicle infrastructure, there's gonna be more emissions. If they use them for projects that uh, you know, transition to the uh, uh, electric vehicles faster, uh, encourage people to do other things like take transit, take you know, bike and walk, then we'll have less emissions. We just don't know at this point um, what this package of projects ultimately is going to look like. So let's talk a little bit about the status of implementation. Um, the formula funds have generally gone out as scheduled. It's not, I mean, it's not easy, but it's also not that hard to send those out the door because the law says who gets how much. Many of the competitive programs have also been launched. Not all of them, but many of them. They've accepted applications. Some of them have awarded funds. Some are even in their second round of applications, which is great. There are still a number of initiatives in the bill that haven't been launched. Um, the, there's some pilot programs, some guidance and regulation that need to be updated. These are very important things. Obviously, Congress wanted them to be done. They're in the law. Uh, but I think the departments have prioritized getting funds out the door 
uh, over updating regulations and guidance, um, despite the fact that that is also important. I think it's fair to say that given the scope and the scale of this bill, reasonable progress has been made. There are some challenges that remain. Again, it was alluded to in the first panel that the time frame for this bill is, is long. People are not gonna see the impacts you know, tomorrow or next week for the most part. This is a, a long-term thing. States and local governments did not have $1.2 trillion worth of projects ready to go. They are now in the process of figuring out what those projects are gonna be, planning them, permitting them, applying for funds, working all that out. So the time frame here, I think people's expectations need to be a little bit reset. Um, it's gonna take a while before, before we fully see the impacts. Um, there's a couple of other you know, challenges with regard to implementation that still remain, even though we're over a year into it. Federal agencies are struggling to hire enough staff. State and local governments are struggling to hire enough staff to deal with all the programs that are available. There are economic issues that are affecting things. We're in a high inflationary environment. The purchasing power of a dollar today is not what it was in November of 2021. Uh, so how do, how do folks handle that? There is an upcoming congressional debate over spending in fiscal year 24 and future fiscal years. We don't know if the infrastructure law programs are going to be kind of swept up in that or not, but that is also something folks should definitely be aware of. I think if these challenges can be overcome, and I know that everyone is working hard to make sure that they are, this bill promises real progress in meeting our infrastructure needs uh, and, the, and the future climate needs of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, that was great. Um, uh, as a reminder, we'll have a Q&A period with our second panel as well, so um, start jotting those down. If you're in our online audience, you can send us an email. Email address to use is ask, ask at eesi.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. Um, this brings us to our second panelist, Kevin Rennert. Kevin joined Resources for the Future as a visiting fellow in 2017, and before RFFs, Kevin served as Deputy Associate Administrator for the Office of Policy at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Leading up to his appointment in the Office of Policy, he worked as Senior Advisor on Energy for the Senate Finance Committee. From 2008 to 2014, he worked on energy and climate legislation as Senior Professional Staff for Senate Energy. In that capacity, Kevin led the development of the Clean Energy Standard Act of 2012, a presidential priority that would have used market mechanisms to double the amount of electricity generated from US, or in the US from low and zero carbon sources. Kevin, welcome to the lectern. I'll get your slides teed up and you can take it away. Thank you. Thanks everybody, it's, it's fantastic to be here. So if I stand up straight, can the people in the back hear me and the mic looks okay? Excellent, good. Um, wonderful. So, uh, so I'm here from Resources for the Future. For those of you that don't know Resources for the Future, we've been around for 70 years in Washington, D.C. We are a nonpartisan uh, you know, economics uh, analysis um, firm. We, I say firm, we are a nonprofit. Um, we've been you know, informing decisions on energy and natural resources um, over that time uh, you know, to, to a great extent, and we would love to be engaged with all of you and the questions that your bosses have. So please come to us with uh, any of the things related to this. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Inflation Reduction Act, since we just talked about the, uh, the bill, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and I'm specifically going to focus on the power sector, um, because that is one area where the, uh, a lot of the emission reductions from the bill are expected to, to come from. Um, and so just to give you a very, very thumbnail sketch of some of the key provisions of this, there are a lot of tax incentives um, in, within the IRA um, that, are, that are quite important. Um, the first is that there is a very long-term extension of production tax credits um, for producing clean electricity. Um, also, the investment tax credits, um, which gives you a, a credit against the capital that you use to build out clean electricity projects. And these have been sort of seminal, very important provisions for a long time to transition the, the power sector to renewable electricity. Um, what happened in the IRA was fundamentally important in that it moved from being a sort of on-again, off-again, short-term extension kind of approach to a very long-term pathway that the sector can build around. So, um, so as a part of that, it actually um, transitioned to a technology neutral um, set of incentives structures, um, which is based on the emissions rates of a given um, you know, kind of generation technology, as opposed to being specified as, a, called out as a technology within the statute itself. This is huge because it's gonna be a long lasting provision and you can just judge new technologies without them having to have you know, a lot of lobbying on the Hill to get them included in, in that you know, list of creditable technologies. 
So the structure was set up a little bit differently in that there is a base rate of $5 per megawatt hour for the PTC and 6% for the ITC. Um, but then there is this layered bonus structure uh, where you can get a five um, times bonus multiplier if you meet prevailing wage and uh, apprenticeship requirements. Another 10% uh, comes from uh, you know, projects that are located in so-called energy communities. Um, there's another bonus um, if you are able to uh, you know, have your projects meet a set of domestic content criteria. Um, so overall, it can actually be an incredibly substantial uh, um, set of incentives for these types of projects. In addition to um, just things that are kind of thought more for renewables, um, we have a production tax credit now for existing nuclear generators, um, which is also tied to market conditions. Um, as a former panelist mentioned, um, the, uh, the 45Q credit for capture and storage um, has been greatly enhanced. It was doubled to $85 per ton. Um, and finally, there are a lot of provisions to make it easier to monetize these tax credits. So tax-exempt entities now connect, are eligible for direct pay, as well as um, you know, those that are, are you know, taxable um, have the ability to transfer these credits um, to others as well, which really streamlines that process and makes it so you don't lose as much value that Congress intended to go to these project developers um, just in the monetization of those tax credits. So that's kind of, there are lots of other tax credits. This is very much a thumbnail sketch. There's a great CRS report that I should have linked to here if you want. ESI has resources. There are a million resources out there that give a much more comprehensive list. But these are the ones that I'm kind of thinking of as I'm showing you results from our modeling exercise to understand what these, uh, these incentives are, are likely to do in the coming years here. So RFF, um, as it, um, in our analysis, we operate two different detailed power sector models. Um, one is called Haiku, one is E4ST, which is referred to as EAST. Normally we do not use these for the same policies because that's a huge duplication um, because they both have their own sort of specialty. But the IRA was an important enough policy and it is now the baseline um, for kind of policies moving forward that both of these models um, were turned on to see how the, the policy would, uh, would interact. Now under, um, I'm gonna showing you sort of two different things, which is probably hard to see from the back. Um, I'm showing you kind of um, changes in electricity capacity. So these are actual steel in the grounds uh, to generate megawatts. And I'm also showing you changes in generation and from what the sources of those are coming from. And generation obviously is the electricity that's being generated from those projects. So under the IRA, um, both of these models, um, well, first of all, I would say that in the baseline, this kind of, um, there's a no IRA case that's shown for both of these, uh, both of these models. You'll see that in both of them, um, for the no IRA case, there definitely were substantial increases in wind and solar expected. That's, that's a part of the baseline expectation. In the presence of the IRA though, with the economic incentives the way that they are, you see that that's, that really is amplified to a tremendous degree. Um, so you see that both models are showing that uh, solar and wind capacity are in particular um, built out well above their historical maximum. Um, so it's a huge deployment that is being shown within these models. You also see that, uh, that uh, you know, as a, another panelist um, kind of alluded to, the CCS um, credits are not expected to be um, you know, very substantially you know, able to um, you know, make those projects viable. And so um, you, what you find is that many of those that are modeling um, these sectors right now um, are seeing that their models see it as so economically viable it wants to retrofit all of the plants um, or build lots of new um, you know, plants moving forward with CCS. And so there's a lot of kind of modeler insights to try to say what are the real world implications and what are the potential real world constraints that will kind of mediate um, some of these kind of economic incentives. You also see that uh, the east between the two um, you know, builds less um, kind of uh, capacity but actually has very similar generation and which is attributable to the fact that it, it sees a higher capacity factor, these resources getting used more often than, than Haiku does. So with that change in kind of clean electricity um, capacity on the grid, what does that mean for emissions? I'm showing you um, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the dark blue line um, on the top is in the absence of the IRA. The lighter blue line um, is in the presence of the IRA, so our new baseline condition. You see that both of the models um, are showing, you know, certainly very substantial CO2 reductions compared to the baseline before, which did not have the IRA present. You also see that even though emissions really come down within the power sector, um, that's the, uh, that they do not reach you know, President Biden's goal of getting to net zero in the power sector um, by 2035. Um, and they also actually don't trigger this, uh, the, um, the value at which the tax credits start to automatically phase out. Um, this is the green line I'm showing here, which represents 25% below 2022 levels of emissions from the power sector. That is said in the statute that if you hit that within the power sector after 2032, the credits start to phase down. We show that in our modeling that you are still expected to be um, at or above that even through 2035, which means that the runway for developers thinking about uh, these credits is, is quite long compared to anything that they've ever seen before. 
Finally, you see that that uh, east between the two models sees greater emission reductions um, due to the CCS that it that builds out, the carbon capture that it builds out. So the way that the IRA was structured as being incentive-based um, is fundamentally different from other approaches that people have thought about in terms of decarbonizing the power sector or other sectors. Because when the government is giving incentives, there's the opportunity for, um, for those incentives to flow through to consumers. And that's sort of standard economic theory, but it's also something that we are seeing um, you know, within the economic models as well. And I'm showing you here the effect on retail electricity prices. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a strange way of looking at this, but we're thinking about the, few, the next 10 years, kind of on average, what a consumer would expect to see in terms of retail electricity prices, just to ground you compared to what electric prices are right now in the national average. The orange is showing um, you know, what the old baseline was without the IRA. The blue is showing you the change with the IRA. And so what you see is that so the blue bars are much bigger and much negative, much more negative, um, because they are actually reducing retail electricity rates um, on the order of between 5 and 7% in the national average, um, just by the virtue of these, uh, of these credits and the value of these credits flowing down to consumers. Another way to think about uh, the IRA is in terms of what it is doing uh, to baseline air quality. Um, as you are reducing the reliance on fossil fuels um, in, in various different parts of the country, um, you are reducing the emissions of, um, of sulfur dioxide, of NOx emissions, and these have really important health benefits. And so when you look at these also in the baseline, you're seeing that uh, that's these uh, reductions of these two particular pollutants are really coming down um, as a result of this, the decreased reliance on fossil fuels. And if you look at this map, you can see that the bars are, are greater in areas where you might expect there to have been greater reliance on fossil fuels. When people think about the benefits of, um, of the IRA, they often think about things like you know, retail electricity rates and, and things of that nature. These improvements of air quality are, are also incredibly important and have benefits that, uh, that often don't get monetized in, in analyses. The final point that I'll make in any of this um, is that uh, that's the way that the IRA was paid for um, is ends up being fairly progressive. And so what we're doing here is, if you think about the way that a household is likely to experience the Inflation Reduction Act, it's going to see um, its, uh, its, its uh, kind of bills change in a few different ways. One is through um, the reductions in electricity um, prices that I already alluded to before, as well as in savings you know, kind of on other goods and services in the economy that are also using, um, kind of re have reduced retail electricity rates. Um, there will also be a change in generator profits. Um, and finally, there's going to be a change in tax burden um, because the IRA itself was funded through a change in the corporate in income tax rate. So if you want to think about what any household is going to experience, it's going to be some kind of combination of all of these. And RFF runs a, a social welfare incidence model um, and has looked at this. Um, and, you, and I'm showing you here the kind of uh, distribution across different income quintiles. The black bar is showing you kind of the nets of all these different pieces. And so what you see when you kind of grind all these things through together, you see that, that the lowest quintiles actually end up coming out ahead, um, all the way up through the you know, kind of the fourth um, quintile, um, where there are, um, they're kind of just, just about uh, kind of coming out even, um, indicating that the entire policy itself and the way that it's paid for ends up being a relatively progressive, progressive uh, way of, of, uh, of funding the package. So in conclusion, um, the IRA is really setting up a market environment that strongly favors the de deployment of new clean electricity. Um, and that's, uh, that our new baseline that includes the IRA um, is you know, kind of suggests that there's going to be substantially greater clean electricity generation, associated reductions in air, um, kind of air pollution, um, and widespread kind of air quality improvements. Um, those tax incentives are reducing retail electricity prices, which is important because it is also then making um, it easier to electrify other sectors um, to reduce emissions from, from those sectors as well. Um, by themselves, the tax credits are not expected to decarbonize the power sector by 2035, um, and those tax credits are expected to be very long-lived. Um, finally, these are economic models. Um, a lot of the real-world conditions that are faced in terms of deploying uh, kind of these projects at the scale and pace that will be needed to achieve in the results in here um, are going to be incredibly important, both to represent in modeling, um, but also to, um, to have policymakers working to address so that, uh, that you can actually achieve the potential of, of these kind of pieces of legislation together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Oops. Uh, thank you, that was great. Uh, and if you'd like to go back and revisit any of Kevin's slides, of course, uh, they're all uh, online at www.eesi.org. We'll scroll through. All right, so our third panelist. We're not even close to being out of IRA and IIJA programs to talk about. And so our next panelist is going to help us understand a big one. 
Uh, Dewan Andrade is the executive director of the Solar and Energy Loan Fund, or SELF, in Florida. She leads the uh, organization and is responsible for raising public, private, and philanthropic capital, overseeing the financial operation, risk management, and loan portfolio performance, and developing innovative financing programs to help low and moderate income populations gain access to affordable capital for sustainable home improvements. Uh, Dewan uh, is a Bolivian national, and she developed a passion for social and environmental justice issues while growing up in eight countries, spawning four continents. Welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Konnichiwa. So um, I'm, after these presentations, I'm just like, wow. Um, I think I'm going to try and bring all of that down to very much a ground level and try to share with you what it looks like to be working in the space and in the spaces that the IRA and all of this will be benefiting. So let's start with this infographic, which is like a very simple you know, way to kind of show uh, and, and demystify how we see the, the IIJA and the IRA working together. The Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, the big picture federal funding for all the, you know, the bridges, the transportation, railways, water. I mean, there is great information about all that right now, and it is huge and amazing. Then the way we see it is, you know, you need to kind of have that flow down to communities. The IRA really focuses on bringing those funds down to kind of a more tangible level by the people in the community. Amazing, finally, we have 40% earmarked, intentionally set up to benefit low-income and disadvantaged communities. That is historic, and we should applaud that tremendously for this administration. So. Now, those uh, funds from the IRA are going to flow through these uh, state agencies, uh, not, sorry, federal agencies like EPA, DO, Department of Energy, DO, uh, DOL, uh, HUD. But really, in the end of the day, in order for those, those funds to reach communities, you're going to need the local governments, the local jurisdictions, and then a plethora of community-based organizations, including community development financial institutions, green banks, credit unions, community-based organizations, and networks, developer network, nonprofit networks. And then all of that can create these resilient, uh, low-carbon, thriving, sustainable communities. So with that, just I'm going to briefly introduce SELF as an example of an implementation tool. Our mission is to rebuild and empower underserved communities by providing accessible and affordable financing to improve healthy uh, and to create and improve uh, homes, make them resilient and sustainable. We are the only and first green bank and CDFI hybrid model in the country. We were created in 2009 by St. Lucie County, Florida with a $3 million DOE grant from the EECBG, that's a lot of letters, from the Energy Efficiency Block Grant. Those $3 million uh, today have raised and leveraged $40 million uh, in capital, direct capital into the organization, and that has now leveraged over a million dollars in project, $100 million in projects. We were created to kickstart the green energy economy. So we're kind of back to where we tried to be 10 years ago, but now we're back with ammunition. So that's a good thing. Um, so then we also operate in Florida. And because there's such a need in the Southeast, we've now expanded to help other organizations across the Southeast. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the Southeast because my question previously to one of the panelists about the equitable deployment of capital is really relevant to us in the South. It is not the same. The policy landscape is not the same in the South and the Southeast as it is in the North and Northeast. So, you know, we're kind of on our own there at the, at the grassroots level. So we know that we need to scale the investments in these resilient, energy efficient, and low carbon uh, buildings, especially housing, because the Southeast is the most vulnerable region to severe events, including hurricanes, extreme heat, and sea level rise. More people in the Southeast are cost burdened than any other part of the country. More than a third of households have trouble paying their energy bills. The Southeast has lower average FICO scores, which means that they can't access capital either to make improvements that will 
benefit not only um, protect their homes, but also reduce energy. And Florida by far, far has the highest percentage of cost burden rent, um, renter households. So what did we do to address these issues? We created a loan program that would address the needs for homeowners, small to mid-sized uh, landlords, developers, contractors, and then a specific project uh, products for solar. Mostly focused on single family homes, now expanding into the broader multifamily. Like I mentioned before, our leveraging of every public dollar is 13 to one. And that is what I would like everybody here to keep in mind, is that these funds ultimately have the power to leverage private capital and really bring those results and those benefits down to the community level. So how does IRA greenhouse gas reduction really help advance climate equity and inclusion? We already talked a lot about how the money flows, the IRA has about $394 billion, going to be broken down mostly in investment through tax credits, which by the way, great idea, but when you think about low-income communities and low-income populations, they don't benefit from tax breaks. They don't have, they don't have the, the base to begin with. Nonprofits don't benefit uh, from tax breaks. So this is why it's incredible that there is a bucket for grants to provide technical assistance to build capacity. It's going to be very important for us to focus on how to best use those funds. And then there is finally the direct pay. So all this time, the ITC, the 30% tax credit for solar was available for, again, for the people that have the money to invest. Well, the direct pay provides a path by which nonprofits can help low and moderate income populations benefit from the 30% ITC. So here we have in the ground, of course, our focus is going to be the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. That's a mouthful. Um, $27 billion to mobilize and leverage private capital for greenhouse gas reduction emission. With a focus on low-income and disadvantaged communities, the goals, of course, are to strengthen the capacity of the ecosystem. Hugely important to consider ecosystems, base ecosystems. Um, it, it also intends to accelerate the transition to equitable net zero economies and to catalyze jobs for the future. Seven billion of these are earmarked to go through states, tribes, municipalities, and eligible nonprofits, the academia. But 20 billion are eligible for nonprofit entities who are then going to deploy the capital down really to the grassroots, the ground level. Those are also going to provide technical assistance and capacity building. This is tremendously important because in the end of the day, Climate resiliency, energy efficiency, and clean ener energy all do what? They save money. So in this time of higher inflation costs, higher costs for capital, higher costs for transportation, higher costs for rent, higher co costs for mortgages, actually all of these investments are going to help put most working class Americans in a better position to save money in on their homes, the place from which every person can get set up to thrive. This is a place where well-being begins. It's the home. So we really think that um, these, uh, th these investments, this funding, are going to catalyze tremendous um, opportunities through, these, through the deployment of these funds in these ecosystems, which include the green banks, CDFIs, credit unions, I've already mentioned them. And I just want to tell you that these organizations are ready to go. They're ready to scale. They're ready to deploy. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. What we have to do is do more of it. We have to replicate. We have to scale. We have to do more. So for example, green banks. There are 24 green banks right now, five nascent green banks in the South and Southeast. They've mobilized $14 billion in 2021 in green projects. Obviously, that has a huge impact in gas reduction, but also saving people money and providing more accessible, resilient, strong homes. CDFIs, about 1,100 CDFIs nationwide, leveraging capacity, eight to one. By the way, the green banks leverage on average three to one, but some of them, like us, we leverage 13 to one. Um, and then there's about 200 CDFIs in the Opportunity Finance Network uh, that are 
already reporting on at least one green product that they offer to communities with a focus on low and moderate income communities. Um, and they are preparing to deploy IRA, GHDR funds. Credit unions play a critical role in helping communities in the face of natural disasters. They also um, help with financial inclusion and coaching and all that. There are about 6,000 uh, 6, institutions nationally serving roughly 100 million consumers in the, net, in the inclusive network alone mobilizing $2.25 billion in green loan products in 2021 and other intermediaries that are ready to go. So I'm just going to leave you with um, an example of really how SELF is kind of a model organization of how we can implement these uh, funds uh, and how we leverage and, and partner in public-private partnerships to effectively make sure that those funds reach communities. We partner with state and local governments, housing authorities, nonprofits. We customize programs, and we leverage local government resources and raise blended capital. 70% of our clients are LMI and have no problem paying back the loan, the loan capital that we provide to them. In fact, we've deployed $30 million with less than 2% default rate, 70%. LMI clients. So with that, I'm going to leave you um, just with some examples. This is, sorry, this is uh, an example of a solar project that we are doing in Miami-Dade with Miami-Dade County. It's a resiliency project. So again, solar for emergency response. This is a water quality. Um, Martin County built the infrastructure, had a little bit of grants, had $200,000 needed to connect 400 households, 200 of them low and moderate income with no access to capital for $10,000 to hook up to the sewer system. We come in, we bring in $2 million, we set up their, their payment plans, and we work with the utility, and now we've deployed about a million dollars in these loans, and people are now having healthier and, so, and safe water in their homes. And to end, this is Pamela. One of our clients, cancer survivor, veteran, no access to funds, uh, less than 500 credit score. Her roof was caving in after hurricane damage. She could not access funds. So what do we do? We bring in funding from US Treasury. We bring in funding from other sources, leverage it, and are able to help her uh, uh, protect her home and access insurance funds. Same thing with hurricane disaster recovery. We fill the gaps and we make it happen. Thank you. It is really hard not to be excited about the potential for leverage with these programs. Uh, it's very cool. Um, it's also very hard not to be excited about all of the uh, home energy rebate programs that are coming down the line. And to help us understand that a little bit more, we come to our fourth panelist. Uh, Jana Barisi serves as the head of the Washington, D.C. office for Lowe's Companies, Inc. In this role, Jana leads federal government affairs strategies for Lowe's, and this includes working closely with company leaders, key legislative and executive branch officials, and industry and trade associations on policy and initiatives relevant to the company's stakeholders, including customers, associates, and communities. Prior to joining Lowe's, she served on the government affairs team at Walmart with increasing levels of responsibility, most recently as senior director of federal government affairs. Jana? Welcome. And just as a note, we are going to go past our allotted time by a little bit, um, but that's okay. So we'll hear Jana, and we'll still get to questions if you're looking at the clock and wondering why. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Are we excited to talk about rebates or what? Um, oh. Okay. Hmm. Okay, there we go. I won't touch it again. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it uh, to be here to talk to you about how we at Lowe's are thinking about uh, the rebate programs in particular, but obviously some of the tax incentives that are relevant uh, to our customers and to the uh, products that we sell. So just quickly about Lowe's, we are a Fortune 50 home improvement company. We have 1,700 stores around the country. We are in every state and Washington, D.C., we employ about uh, 300,000 uh, associates around the country, and we process about 17 million transactions a week. Um, so, and, and again, focused in the home improvement space. 
I would just share too, as we think about customers and, and point of sale, I think this is really relevant. So if you think about our, the Lowe's customer, uh, we kind of have customers in, and serve customers in different ways through different segments. So we have what we call the do-it-yourself customer. So that's you or I going into a store and maybe buying something or buying an appliance and um, it, installing it on our own. Um, we have a services business, so we call that sort of the do-it-for-me customer, right? So maybe a customer buys something, but then we can connect them with a service provider who can install that product. Um, in some cases, we may not sell the product, but we can connect the customer with a service provider. So think of like an HVAC, for example. We don't have those on the shelves, but we can help connect uh, customers with relevant service providers. And then we have our pro customer. So that is a contractor that's doing projects for consumers. Um, so I raise that because I think those are all really important segments, um, customer segments that are gonna require different types of information and, and a different understanding of kind of how these programs specifically are relevant to them. So we've, we've talked about this a bit, obviously. We, I think everybody's familiar with this. Um, it's just all the relevant uh, tax provisions and the two rebate programs. What I would say on the tax incentives is I think our teams are just thinking about how do we inform customers about their potential availability or relevance to them. I think every customer is going to be different, right, in terms of their interest in or sensitivity to a tax incentive, but just thinking through how do you at least get that information to them so they're aware that um, these incentives are available. And there may be some other services opportunity in this space, like there are some small pilots going on, for example, in terms of solar installation. So that's a place too where the, uh, the tax incentive piece becomes relevant to deploying that business. Um, I thought this was helpful too because we talked about this program earlier and kind of some of the income verification pieces, but it's just helpful to see the specific products that are enumerated in the statute that are eligible for the rebates. Again, some of these we uh, sell directly when you think about an electric stove or cooktop. Um, others we don't. And then as we think about kind of the marketplace and inventories, um, for example, there aren't a lot of heat pump dryers, clothes dryers on the market in the US today. And so do manufacturers look at that opportunity differently? And you know, does the assortment change based on the availability of those incentives? And then of course the homes program, um, which we also talked about earlier. Um, what I would say about that is, you know, I think this is a program, perhaps not exclusively, but that more often is going to include more stakeholders, right? A contractor, a home energy auditor, and so again, thinking about, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, a consumer level benefit, but when you've got these other players in the mix, kind of how are they, how are they interacting with the program and potentially, you know, passing through the benefit to the consumer. So I really just want to focus on, on this piece and maybe give back a little time um, so we can get to Q&A, but conversation earlier, obviously, about income verification um, and how that's going to work. And, and obviously, we will not be doing that as retailers, but that is relevant to how consumers interact with the program. And um, the question about sort of what they're going to get uh, that deems them eligible, that we know that they're eligible um, when they come into a store, interact with us online. Um, and I think it's important to remember, too, that technically under the statute, the project is also supposed to be verified. So if, you, if it's new construction or swapping out a, um, a gas stove for an electric stove or um, some other gas-powered appliance, um, and so that's going to be relevant, too, in terms of uh, what the details are around that, and is it a self-attestation by the consumer or, or something like that. Um, and then we get to point of sale, and I think that goes back, too, to my point about the customer segments, right? So we think of point of sale as our cash registers, right? So when people are coming to check out at the front of the store or online. Um, and so this uh, question, for example, about uh, a universal coupon, what exactly does that look like? Um, and are there technological requirements to upgrade the, the POS systems or to change them so they can interact with those? And I think that goes to some of the questions too about, um, you know, we recognize there's going to be state level flexibility, but is there opportunity for some common specs, particularly on something like that, where it could require um, some uh, 
technological implementations um, on our side. Um, and so basically how, again, like what does a customer receive once they're deemed eligible? And then the other question is, um, for example, in some cases, let's say you're getting a water heater, but you'd be working with your contractor or service provider. Um, if you're the eligible entity, but they're buying it to then install it, how does that benefit flow through? So I think some, some questions on that front. Um, and then consumer education, obviously that's been talked about a lot, um, but just given some of the complexities about not everyone being eligible for the rebates, um, again, with the homes program, the necessity to probably have some baseline analysis done by a home energy auditor, just how are we simply um, seamlessly getting information to customers about the potential availability of these benefits. Um, also recognizing that there's going to be some nuances, um, you know, given, given the eligibility things. And, you know, obviously from location to location, um, media income um, assessments are different, right? And so even from place to place, somebody who might be making the same amount, you know, may not be eligible in the same way. And then one other thing I would mention is, you know, obviously there's the big focus on point of sale. Um, we see circumstances where people are coming in and more of an emergency situation, right? My hot water heater broke, I need to replace it. Um, hopefully, and, and this I think is gonna hinge pretty heavily on how the verification process works, but certainly we would be, we would encourage consideration of, you know, in limited circumstances that somebody could apply for a post-sale rebate in that type of situation if they had to buy the product, you know, in, in short order um, because something had failed in their home, um, but they could potentially be eligible for the rebate that there's a chance for um, them to, to come back and get that. Um, so we have some teams that do consumer insights, and I just thought that this would be helpful a little bit to share just some of the things that we've heard in early conversations, and again, it's you know with our DIY customers, but also the pro customers. Um, you know, you you can read these, but I I think it's interesting um, just in terms of how you know this one in the middle. You know, five years ago, I never had a customer ask me if I'm using sustainable products. Now that's something that's a lot more common, um, and property managers sort of using it as a potential selling point um, that a place is is more energy efficient. Um, on the DIY side, though, some question about how much consumers are willing to replace something if it's not at the end of its life, right? Even if there are incentives. Um, so you see this, I don't like spending money. I don't see myself replacing just because it's energy efficient, especially if it's still working. Um, but conversely, somebody that's in the construction business, you know, making the choice to put in the more energy efficient product um, because they would see that uh, as a selling point. Um, so one other thing I want to mention too is just around the the skilled trades and, and contractor training piece. I know obviously there's a lot of funds um, in the IRA for contractor training and that those programs will have to be developed by the states. Um, we recently announced a program, uh, $50 million over five years to get 50,000 more people into the skilled trades. Um, and so those, the first tranche of grants will be for community colleges. Um, and so that's, it'll be interesting to see kind of where and how some of these um, investments and programs potentially complement each other um, as our program uh, gets moving and the funds start flowing through from the IRA as well. So all that to say, and I wanna introduce my colleague, Robert Karras. Um, we've been working a lot on this and um, we appreciate the partnership and conversations that we've had with Department of Energy, with NASIO, with many others, um, as we bring our perspectives to the table about how to make this functional and operational, um, acknowledging state flexibility, but where there's maybe opportunities for DOE to provide some, some turnkey options um, and where um, certain things sort of occurring at scale will make it easier and more efficient for us to uh, inform both our customers and our associates um, about the availability of these programs and the benefits they can provide. So, thank you. My turn to deal with the microphone once again. That was great, thank you so much. 
Uh, and we do have time for questions. Like I said, we're going to run a little long, um, but that's OK. And I have a couple here from the online audience. But if there's anyone in the room, I am scanning for hands. Um, and maybe what I'll do while we're waiting is start with a question that came in um, from their online audience. And I'm going to ask it, because I also know who this person is. And he's a good guy. Um, and I think, actually, it, it gets to a lot of, of what you're what everyone was talking about, and that is outreach and communication uh, to the people who uh, sort of across the spectrum who will be involved in getting these projects in place, especially perhaps when it comes to the environmental justice community. So the question is, what steps are planned for outreach and communication to targeted populations to ensure that um, the people uh, um, who apply for these rebates or who are designed or who are intended to benefit from these programs actually benefit? And Sarah. Happy to start with you since it's been a while since we've heard, but anyone, please feel free to jump in uh, with your thoughts about how we communicate these benefits to, to these different populations. Uh, thank you. So focusing on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, it wasn't actually a lot of rebates um, focused more on public infrastructure, but the, the challenge of involving community members in development of infrastructure projects is, is something that's been... Um, so, uh, a focus for a long time of transportation and infrastructure agencies because you do get better results when you have input and engagement from the people who are ultimately going to use the project. Um, transportation planners are great. They don't necessarily know the ins and outs of every intersection or every bus stop. Um, and so getting that input is really incredibly valuable. Uh, they're, they're, the Department of Transportation recently released kind of a best practices guide to uh, public engagement, which has a lot of very useful strategies. But I think that the challenge is um, on the uh, side of community organizations. They don't have a lot of resources, and this law is huge. There's so much information coming at them. How can they parse it out? So I think for the congressional staff in the room, to the extent that you are meeting with constituents or transportation agencies, um, helping them understand the value of engaging with each other and kind of pointing them to what you think might be the most um, important opportunities for them to work together on is, is a really important role that I think you could play. Just kind of helping everybody parse through all the chatter that's going on about these laws and help people really focus on resources that can, can help them. Please feel free to jump in if anyone else would like to make a comment, Kevin or Dawn. I would just say that um, just adding to that is y there's an issue of trust in communities. And that has to be addressed. And the way to address that in our experience is to work with the community organizations. It's very hard to get to one-on-one -on -one, you know, and all that. But there are established community organizations that should be used and listened to and just you know, kind of the same comment um, that Sarah was, uh, was uh, saying here. The one other thing that I think is really important is the messaging. Uh, you know, We talk about climate resilience. I mean, it's just like these big words that really mean simple stuff, like your roof replacement, your window replacement, making your home safer, healthier, better. You know, how you message this has a lot to do with how people receive it. All right, um, I'm gonna ask another, oh, we have a question in the back, Tyler. My question actually was in response to what Sarah had just said a minute ago. Uh, there's a local transit agency, which most of us are familiar with, that uh, both just before the pandemic and subsequently is engaging in a fairly wide ranging review of uh, its bus operations. And the community engagement was mostly very selective. Uh, there were uh, invited persons to participate in the earlier discussions and the more recent discussions. And while there were occasional pop-ups to try and reach regular people, uh, they were few and far between and not noticed in advance. And it, one just found them by happenstance. I, I don't know what is in the DOT's new public engagement uh, manual, uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, agencies and, and the states need to do a better job on a regular basis, I would suggest, I don't know anything, but would suggest in reaching out to the public, actually the consumers of the service, uh, riders of transit, uh, drivers on the roads, 
to see what they think. And with regard to the suggestion that since most people here are congressional staff, I know in my case, my representative never talks to me, but he will talk to my mayor. And then if he's feeling liberal, he'll talk to our, my city council. Uh, congressional staff should be encouraged to uh, consider that odd person such as myself who wanders into a congressional briefing, not me, but people like me, and reach out to them. I mean, the regular folk have ideas and they're not reached by the traditional transit agency process that I'm familiar with. I don't know if anyone has a, I'm not sure if anyone has a response, but please feel free. Well, not a response, but a, but a comment. Um, I do think that we, we don't, we government generally, I don't know why I say we, because I'm not government, but government generally does not do a great job of, of talking about the programs and the plans and the projects in a way that makes sense to people. That doesn't make people want to engage. Um, we, we just, and there are plenty of, of requirements for public engagement in the transportation program. There's like four different plans or five or six now with the new law that require public engagement and outreach. What, you know, many people do not have time to engage in six different planning processes. They don't know which one is the most important, which one is gonna have the biggest effect on them. So this is, this is really an important area and I think that comment speaks to it a lot. Thank you. All uh, right, I think we'll wrap up with a rapid fire question. Um, we'll give everyone an opportunity to, to respond here, but we've talked a lot, talked, the four of you cover a lot of these programs. There's a lot of programs out there. We've covered a lot of ground, but for our congressional staff and the audience, are there things in the, on the horizon, big next steps uh, in the programs and the um, investments and policies that you all are tracking that you would just highlight as something for people to be on the lookout for, say in the next several months, with respect to the IIJA and IRA implementation. And um, happy to uh, start with Jana, if you'd like to go first, and then we'll move down the line. Sure, glad to. Uh, I'm sure many of you know on the IRA consumer rebate programs, DOE had an RFI that closed at the end of last week. It's a blur. Um, and so I'm sure um, they're reviewing that feedback. And um, you know, I think an important next step is just gonna be the ongoing conversations about program design and um, implementation and, and timing of fund, funds flows and when the states can start, um, you know, putting in their plans and proposals. Um, so I think, you know, it's still a question from where we sit of, you know, when, w you know, when we process that first rebate, right? Um, but those are all the next steps in the process that we're keeping an eye on and staying engaged in. Yeah, so we are um, paying very much attention to the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and waiting for the NOFO, the final you know, uh, rules that come out from the EPA. They said there are gonna be two to 15 recipients of those funds that then will you know, channel and make those uh, funds flow through community-based organizations. Uh, one thing that has happened is that the timeline has moved, has moved, so now we have like another year that we're gonna be waiting for those funds. So I think that it's gonna be important um, to look out for kind of the, the gap filling pieces of the IRA. So some of the programs we heard today from Department of Energy, uh, how can communities know, be alerted uh, to uh, programs that can help build capacity and provide technical assistance to prepare the communities for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund funds actually. So those two things. One last thing to pay attention to is a direct pay. There's still a lot of mystery as to how that's going to work and uh, we're eager to demystify it but we're already coming up with strategies and programs that we think would work to capture that direct pay. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a really important point. Kevin? Sure, I'll highlight just a few as well. Um, as there's certainly still guidance coming out from uh, from Treasury on uh, th some of the tax credits. So, like the hydrogen tax credit is going to have important, uh, you know, guidance coming out. Also, just the overlay with uh, with regulations that will be coming out um, is going to be a really critical one. And how, for example, EPA regulations think about uh, their regulatory environment now that it is in a world in which the economic incentives are so important and so beneficial to clean electricity. That will be a really important uh, kind of interaction to watch as well. Thanks. Sarah, I think this gives you the last word. I guess so. Um, so three things, although by the time all of us go through, there's like 12 things you have to pay attention to. Number one, appropriations and the debt limit. 
These are two really important conversations that are going to happen this summer in Congress about federal spending. Um, and they can affect taxes, they can affect spending, they can affect all of these programs that we've just talked about. So keep an eye on that and please engage um, and hopefully support these uh, important programs we've talked about today. I hope I'm allowed to say that on behalf of BPC. Um, second, as I mentioned, and as Duan just mentioned too, uh, there are a lot of technical assistance programs. Bipartisan Policy Center actually has a blog post uh, up online which highlights a number of them. There, are, there is a White House document that lists 65 different technical assistance programs across the federal government that state and local uh, communities can access to get help with implementing these programs. Even sorting through 65 programs is a lot, so they might need technical assistance to understand the technical assistance. But you all can play a role in helping to connect your communities with these federal resources. And lastly, there needs to be kind of a feedback loop from the federal government, and this is something that is sort of forward-looking. We're talking right now about how much money has gone out the door. Eventually, we're going to want to know what has been the outcome of those investments. And I, want, I, I don't know that federal agencies right now are thinking about how they're going to track and measure that, but it's something for you as, as uh, staff to think about. You know, What are you going to want to know about in 2026, 27, whenever we start talking about this again in terms of a new law? And let's start, let's start tracking and measuring that today. Well, that's a great note to end on. Please thank our panelists and join me with a round of applause. Thank you so much. That was really excellent. Our first two panelists are also still in the room, so thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank our, our sponsor, uh, or our host, I should say, for today, Representative Tonko and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Uh, it means a lot. He helped us a great deal throughout the entire uh, series of climate camp briefings. And so um, thanks very much to him and his great staff for helping us get this great room and um, uh, uh, bring these issues to staff. I'd also like to take my, uh, uh, I, well, not take my, I'd like to thank the folks I work with at EESI. I don't know, it's been a long day. Um, I'd especially like to thank Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, Emma, Allison, Anna, and Molly for all the hard work that went into this and all of our Congressional Climate Camp series and all of the upcoming briefings, uh, which we've got a bunch coming up, uh, and also other additional resources and things. So thanks very much. Thanks to Lindley, Tyler, and Madeline, who are great spring interns for all of their contributions as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you, Curtis, for helping us with our videography and making sure that our live cast looks and sounds great. Um, this is uh, the last slide of the day. This is a survey link. If folks in our in-person or online audience have a moment to take our survey and to share uh, comments about how today went. Did you have any issues with the video or the audio? Do you have any other questions or, or ideas for additional briefings? We read every response. Uh, and so if you have two minutes, we really appreciate every uh, one's um, uh, willingness to share that feedback. Um, I'll also say uh, one last thing uh, about uh, sort of internal stuff at ESI. We're actually recruiting uh, summer interns right now, and we're also recruiting for a policy associate. So visit us online at www.esi.org if you're interested in learning more about that. And next Wednesday, March 15th, we'll be back on the Hill, downstairs, I think in room 2044, uh, with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy to talk about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. We'll be back on March 23rd with our friends at the Natural Resources Defense Council to talk about organics and agriculture. And we'll be back in April 18th with more friends from the Department of Energy, this time in the Nuclear Energy Programs Office, talking about the wide range of uh, programs uh, underway, in large part funded by the IIJA. So with that, thanks for indulging a little bit of overage today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks again, panelists, for joining us. And thanks to our great audience. Thank you. <laughs>